pleasant good afternoon to you and welcome to this service in celebration of the life of Jerry Schmunk. It's lovely to have you here. It's my privilege to uh, officiate at this time. Um, I want to begin by setting a tone for the service, which is a, a tone of celebration. Uh, and I want to do it by reading something uh, that Jerry wrote um, so that the tone will be fully in keeping with uh, who he was. Um, back in 1972, he wrote an op-ed uh, that was published in the Oregonian. And it was about the announcement of then Mayor Terry Shrunk's decision not to seek another term. Uh, he'd been mayor of Portland forever. Uh, and the title of Jerry's piece was called So Long Terry, You Old Name Dropper. Again, this is from 1972. Terry Shrunk's decision not to seek another term after holding Portland's highest office since 1956 comes as somewhat of a shock and disappointment to me. My reasons, however, are not what you would expect. You see, my name is Jerry Schmunk, a good German name that many people somehow delight in mispronouncing and misspelling. Ever since 1956, I've been able to tell people it's Schmunk pronounced like the mayor's name, except that I have an M where he has an R. That simple declaration has saved me countless hours of explanation and has no doubt speeded the delivery of my mail and also has made it easier for others to introduce me. <laughs> but now that's all gone. I'll be on my own. My mail will start coming addressed to Jerry Schmuck. <laughs> and I'll have trouble recognizing my own name when pronounced by people who don't know me well. I suppose I could salvage the situation by entering the mayor's race myself. My name is similar enough to Mayor Shrunks that considering voter apathy and the large pack of candidates to, to choose from, I could probably breeze into the position before most would realize another man had been elected. The key to my success would be to lay low and say nothing. I can remember once when I attended a Chamber of Commerce banquet, I was almost seated at the head table until he saw that I wasn't the mayor. <laughs> when I really think about it, I'm, so, I'm sort of glad Mayor Shrunk is stepping down. I'm tired of his trading on my name, familiarity, and popularity. <laughs> Which made, makes me think that uh, the Terry Shrunk Plaza across from the federal building downtown should be renamed the Jerry Schmunk Plaza for at least a day, don't you think? <laughs> we'll think of that at least as we worship together at this time. Uh, we'll now hear on Eagle's Wings.
Thank you, Ken. And if you'd like to join me uh, as we say together the Hebrew uh, reading from Ecclesiastes, please join me. It's <clears throat> printed in the bulletin. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. Time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Amen. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, my apologies to football fans in the, uh, yeah, I guess everywhere, but particularly in this room, having a uh, celebration of life for my dad at two o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday is quite ironic. Um, we are pretty sure he would not be attending his own funeral. <laughs> We've put together a slideshow of some of our favorite moments from my dad's life, and we hope that you enjoy reliving these moments with us together today. After the completion of the slideshow, we'd like anyone who feels moved to do so to come up and share memory or anecdote. Please enjoy the show and the musical accompaniment.
this might take me a minute. Uh, everybody here knew my dad, and I'd just like to share a little bit today about who he was for me. My dad was a huge college football fan. He loved the Oregon Ducks, number one. The rest of the Pac-12 came in second, and then anybody who wasn't in the SEC was third. He loved to root for the underdog. I honestly think that he was more relaxed watching the Ducks when they weren't doing well rather than when they were picked to win. He hated all that pressure. So naturally, as a young girl, I learned to hate Oregon and the SEC, but he and I agreed about that part. You see, back then, the Ducks weren't a very good football team. And so when the Ducks lost, my dad was sure to be in a terrible mood for the rest of the day. So it only made sense that when I was looking to go to college, Oregon wasn't even on the list of possibilities. In fact, unfortunately for my dad, he ended up paying tuition at Oregon State for both David and I. While I didn't love the Ducks, I did learn to love football. And many of my favorite memories with my dad were watching games together on the couch in our basement. After I moved away, we still watched games together and had phone calls after the games to recap. During great games, a halftime phone call might be warranted. The man of few words, as my mother would often refer to him, which was ironic given his career was in PR, he always had something to say about football. The only thing my dad was as passionate about as Oregon football was his family. As many of you know, I was a gymnast, which was a huge time commitment for me as a kid. But what I did not realize until I became a parent myself was the time commitment for my parents. They were the ones who made sure I was at practice every day. They were the ones that spent hours watching me perform on the weekends. I can't imagine my dad enjoyed spending his Saturdays in a gymnasium sitting on bleachers for hours just to get to watch me perform for a total of two minutes over four apparatuses. But he did, and he supported me doing what I loved. When, <clears throat> when I took my love of football and gymnastics and decided to become an athletic trainer, he was on board 100%. He traveled with me to my interviews for grad school. He drove across the country with me when I moved to Oklahoma. He would watch Oregon State, Oklahoma, and Stanford football games, all the while looking for me on the sidelines. When I married Hans, he started watching USF and Rice football games with the same intensity and always looking for Hans. My dad taught me how to be passionate and driven. He showed me how to love my family. He also taught me how to interact with people and how to interact with the world around me. He gave everyone in life a fair shake. And he, this, it isn't lost on me how incredible my dad was in this way. He believed in caring for our planet, protecting its resources for generations to come. He had a special place in his heart for animals, for, um, sorry, I've lost my spot here, <laughs> for animals, for kids, and for the underprivileged. As a child, I loved loving football with my dad and sharing that passion. As I grow older now, though, I can see how much more we have in common, how much he shaped who I am and what I believe, and not just what I do. I'm intensely aware of the impact that my dad had on many of you in the room and on the lives of many unable to join us today. My dad was a remarkable man. And if I can serve others with even half of the love he gave out in his lifetime, I will have lived well. script here. Uh, but thank you all for coming and thank you Jen for going first after that slideshow.
you don't know, you don't know how lucky you are. Those are the last words my dad said to me, and I just showed him my eight-month-old daughter happily playing in her car seat. I could probably do better at appreciating how lucky I am, but that was not a problem for him. He was a man of simple pleasures who could it? <laughs> who could really appreciate a, uh, a hamburger and a milkshake and, or, a, uh, or extra crispy bacon or playing cards with family and friends or a happy baby. It's not to say he liked everything. He, uh, he liked things his way and uh, everyone knew if he wasn't happy. But he was mischievous and funny. He was earnest and generous and he cared for everybody. He was proud to have been a civil servant for his entire career and always rooted for the underdog, unless his ducks were playing, unless his ducks were favored. <laughs> and we're sad, of course, because our worlds are smaller without him. But he was a good man that lived a full life and we should all appreciate how lucky we are to have shared our time with him. Thank you. So if uh, you'd like to take a moment, uh, we'd ask that you come forward so you could be heard uh, and uh, give us a few words of uh, tribute if you'd like. Do you want the mic? Or you could, yeah, it, is the mic available for that? Can we take it to folks? Oh, great. Okay, we can take the mic to you. Carolyn Palmer and her <coughs> cousin to Janet and Dick and me and uh, Don and Jerry. And I loved spending summers at their home, uh, mainly because it was more fun than my house was, because her mom, their mom was uh, a little bit more uh, understanding of kids' ways. And we had lots of uh, fun times together. But what I really remember about my cousin Jerry was his absolute devotion to all things cowboy. Absolutely cowboy. Even, I think, to the six shooter. And he had a cowboy hat and a chaps shirt. Anyway, he was a fun young man and he became a fine father. Man, a few words would appreciate that. <laughs> I won't be long either. Um, thinking of this man I did not know, but who I know gave his brain to research for Parkinson's, uh, which moves me to read the following uh, words from a young woman whose father passed away of Parkinson's and had these things to say that I think will resonate here and now. This is by Dana Seafried. She says, my dad was a person with Parkinson's. We may be tempted to comfort ourselves with thoughts like, he had the disease, but it didn't have him. While that may have been true in in the first five years or so, it did not as the disease slowly destroyed the dopamine in his brain. To minimize, to deny is a slippery slope at the bottom of which is 
acquiescence, and we concede the battle, but we cannot concede the battle because dad has died. There are people in this room who have Parkinson's disease, who will get Parkinson's disease, who have loved ones with Parkinson's. And I invite you to make the same promise that I made to my dad, that I will continue to make life better for people with it, to support research for more effective treatment and to find a cure. Even in death, my dad is with us in these efforts. And I'm sure that's very true in this case. I become, she says, somewhat haunted and distressed by the question, are we our brains? If dad's character, his integrity, his graciousness, his intelligence and wit lie in the chemicals and neural pathways of his brain, and these are depleted and twisted, where then will I find his essence? In truth, my question was, where is his soul? I was troubled off and on by this question about the nature and place of dad's soul in a body racked by a neurological disease until dad began actively dying. Only in the last few days have I arrived at an understanding. I see that as so many cared for dad's physical self, we, we cared with unwavering love and respect for his spiritual self as well. We cupped dad's soul in our hands as we bathed him, massaged him, held his hands, made jokes, laughed at his jokes, hugged him, held him, fed and gave him drink. We touched and nur nurtured his soul every time he invited us into his reality such as it was, and we joined him there. Where does dad's soul reside now? as he was in life, now so in death. He is of the water. His spirit is floating on the soft, glistening ripples of waves. He is of the earth. His spirit walks the shores and hills of Cannon Beach. He is of the sky. His spirit flies with the great blue heron. He is of the air. He is around us now and always. We can breathe him in. As his soul encircles us for the rest of our lives, we will continue to feel his love and to love him back. Join me in prayer, if you will, now. Our great creator, look kindly upon us in our sorrow and loss for this wonderful life being taken from us, a man quiet but mighty. Gather our pain now into your peace. Heal our memories and any regrets we might have. Be present to our grieving and overcome any smallness in us with your great love. Awaken our gratitude for your gifts of love and tenderness through Jerry as we are able to receive them and teach us the lessons of life that he teaches subtly and with great love. Amen, now and amen forever. We'll sing, uh, before we close, just a couple of verses of Amazing Grace. So if you wanna find a hymnal, or I think we'll have the words above, uh, just the first and the last verse of that uh, great old hymn.
love. Make haste to be kind. You made the peace of Christ with